I think that um, Christians are realizing uh, that they need to flex some other muscles. Uh, because right now our cities are hurting, uh, the black community is hurting, our world is hurting, and I'm just not sure that I've seen the kind of response and support that the church was called to be in moments like these. Uh, at my church, I use two words pretty often. And you heard Brian mention one of them, and I wrote a book kind of centered around it. The first word is hospitality. At my church, we believe that the greatest opportunity we have is hospitality. And here's what I mean by that. That the church's greatest opportunity is to extend a kind of hospitality to our neighbors that will radically change the landscape that we live in with our neighbors. And at our church, we value hospitality in the deepest way, not simply opening the doors to our home, uh, because in New York and in other major cities, you barely have space to have your own family in there. So we're not talking about a kind of hospitality that <clears throat> opens the door to their home, but a kind of hospitality that opens your life to your neighbor where we extend to our neighbors the very things that refresh us, not just the things that we're done using. And that's really important to understand about hospitality because I think in America, especially if you're in the American South, you can uh, dilute your understanding of hospitality simply by what spread you have on the table or how many people you can make room for. But I think the reality of hospitality as we see it in scripture is much deeper than that and has uh, much more power to transform than just the people you invite. So we wanna be able to offer a kind of hospitality. The second word that I often use at my church is imagination. Now imagination is a really important word uh, and it doesn't have to do with mysticism. In our world right now, we need to have an imagination that goes beyond what we see. Because really, when I talk about imagination, I'm essentially talking about vision. What do you see for the world? And can you live toward that imagination? I remember one time asking my son to imagine a pig fly. And he kind of just looked at me with a side eye. He was just like, Poppy, I've never seen a pig fly. And I said, well, just imagine it. And, you know, he, he, he wrestled to try to imagine what a pig flying could look like because he had no reference for it. And he kind of came back after several minutes and he drew a pig with wings on it. And he says, this is what I got. And I said, well, that's what it is. And I asked him, <clears throat> Bobby, a lot, of, a lot of our faith is built on the expectation and anticipation of a world where there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more death. And I looked at him and I said, Bobby, doesn't that take quite the imagination to envision? And he said, yeah, but I'm not sure why. And I said, I'll tell you why. Because right now the world that we exist in is filled with tears, pain, and death. You still, the idea of being able to move toward a world that God promises where there is no more tears, no more pain, no more death, takes quite a bit of imagination, doesn't it? So you see, when you, when you talk about hospitality and you talk about imagination, it's important for us to say, how are we doing that? How are we living that? Matthew 23, verse 23, Jesus confronts the religious leaders of his time, those who were entrusted with creating a space for people to be cared for and move towards God. And he and he said to them, y'all are really concerned with tithing your mint and dill and don't concern yourselves with the weightier matters of justice, mercy. Jesus confronted the religious leaders of his time that the weightier matters that they should be concerned with, not at the compromise of other aspects of their journey, was that of justice and mercy. In the fourth century, 
after Jesus' death and his resurrection, the Roman emperor Julian, he said this about the Christians. He said, these impious Galileans, referring to Christians, not only feed their own poor, but also welcoming into their meals, they attract as children are attracted with cakes. He said, not only do these Christians feed their own poor, but ours also, welcoming them into their meals, attracting them as children are attracted with cakes. Now, I love this because not only is this a powerful statement about Christians and their hospitality, but it's also a profound statement about integrity. You see, for the early church, there was no distinction between what they believed and how they lived their belief. You see, to them, saying that they walked with God was also to demonstrate God to the world in real time and in real place. You see, their faith manifested itself in the midst of their times. And I love that because it communicates integrity. It means that what you believe is the same, what you believe inside is the same as how you live outside. That the structure from within is what influences and determines the behavior from without, whether that was through invitation, mercy, love, forgiveness, sacrifice, service, and justice. So I want to read for us Amos chapter 5. I know that we were set to preach through Matthew 6, but because Brian gave me the green light, I said, bet, we're going to read something that's been burning in my heart. Amos chapter 5, verse 18 through 28. The prophet Amos, God uses to say this. Woe to those of you who long for the day of the Lord. What will the day of the Lord be for you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be a man who flees from a lion only to have a bear confront him. He goes home and rests his hand against the wall only to have a snake bite him. Won't the day of the Lord be darkness rather than light, even gloom without any brightness in it? I hate, I despise, the Lord says, I despise your feasts. I can't stand the stench of your solemn assemblies. Even if you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will have no regard for your fellowship offerings are fattened cattle, of fattened cattle. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. House of Israel, was it sacrifices and grain offerings that you presented to me during the 40 years of wilderness? But you have taken up Sukkoth, your king, and Kaiwan, your star god, images that you have made for yourself. So I will send you into exile beyond Damascus. The Lord of the God of armies is his name. He has spoken. A few things that I think Amos does in this passage that I want to be able to um, highlight for us. The first is this. He he crushes false hope. Amos crushes false hope in this passage. And and you know what's crazy? I'm I'm not trying to crush everyone's hope. I, I think that this text is crushing a particular kind of hope. You see, we're living in in the midst of a lot of unquestionable pain, the constant pain and pressures of COVID-19, which in our city uh, feels incredibly overwhelming, taking us, taking from us, I should say, family and work and livelihood. And if that doesn't seem like enough, we have to live under the weight of America's knee on our necks, keeping us from the breath that God in the very beginning breathed into our nostrils, giving us life. And in the midst of all this, I hear many Christians say things like, Lord, come quick. In the midst of all this, I hear a lot of Christians say, Lord, come quick or Lord, take us home, which I should say, I I understand the sentiment. There are many times where I feel like this life is overwhelming and it makes me all the more eager for the world that God is bringing. There is a hope that some Christians have that believe that Jesus coming back, he will make things right. Or that he will set this world into the way that he intended for it. There's a a hope that we have that when we say, Lord, come, we will expect God to make the world right. And, And let me just say, I believe that. I share that sentiment. I am convinced that 
when the Lord finally establishes his kingdom uh, fully and once and for all that things will be set right. But I have a problem with that statement. And I think if you're on this call, you should too. I have a problem with the statement, Lord, come quick. Not because I don't believe it, but because it means at least two other things. One, it means that you're convinced that you and Jesus have the same thing in mind when you use the word right. Or you think about the same thing, or you have the same purpose and intention for the world as Jesus does. I don't like the statement, Lord, come quick, not because I don't believe it. Legacy, let me be clear. It's not because I don't believe it, but because I know that it could mean at least two other things. One is that you are convinced that you and Jesus have the same thing in mind when you use the word right. Or when you think about the vision for this world, you believe and are convinced that it's the same vision Jesus has for the world. And I'm not sure that it is. The second reason why I'm not excited about that term when Christians use it oftentimes is that you believe that Jesus will come back to preserve your version of the way things should function. Now think about this for a moment. If I say, Lord, come quick in the midst of a lot of pain and a lot of uh, frustration, I'm saying it because the world as I know it and as perhaps I want it is being disrupted. So, Lord, come quick and preserve, restore the world as I desire it. So, Lord, come quick. Amos asks an unbelievable question in this passage that I think we should seriously consider. He says, what will the day of the Lord be for you? (laughs) What will the day of the Lord be for you? What does the text say? The text told us that the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. It will be like a man who flees from a lion only to have a bear confront it. He goes home and rests his hands on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Now, up to this point, historically, it's really important to understand that Israel is convinced that they are good with God. As far as their relationship is concerned, they're straight. They've got nothing to worry about. In fact, verse 14, just a few verses before, tells us that Israel felt this way because they believed that the Lord was with them. You go and Verify the kid. Verse 14 says that they were convinced of this, that the Lord was with them, that they were straight because the Lord was with them. And listen, I mean, if you convince yourself that the Lord is on your side, then you're feeling pretty good about yourself. But but you're not feeling so good about anyone who's not rocking with you. Have you ever have you ever thought that you and a friend were good? That y'all were cool, but then something happened to let you know that you were wrong? That y'all wasn't cool? Well, in these verses, Amos happened. (laughs) Amos happened to Israel. Amos, Amos comes in and he totally ruins their party. These are the Lord's people. He says to them, woe to you. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Almost as if to say, God coming isn't a good thing for you. It's actually a terrible thing for you. Back in in, in chapter three, verse three, Amos asks another really important question that we should consider. He said, can two walk together without agreeing to me? In other words, can you commit to a person without committing to who they are, what they love and what they value? It's a rhetorical question, of course. The answer is obviously no, you cannot. And what this question was meant to remind us is that when we commit to a relationship, any kind, friendship, marriage, church, we are committing to being aware of the character and the values of the person that we are walking with. The question was meant to make us aware that that what we get most out of knowing God is communion with God. Hear me, y'all. The most important thing, the, the, the most important thing that we get from knowing God is communion with God, which means engaging with the nature of God. In other words, this is what Ephesians talks about, that when he pours his love into us, it's not simply so that we can be uh, uh, gluttons of his love, but so that we can engage with his love and therefore walk out with love. And so what Amos is saying here is essentially that you cannot walk with God and be unaware or uninfluenced by his greatness. 
He said, can two people walk together without first agreeing to meet? Listen, you cannot walk with God and be uninfluenced or, or unaware at the very least of God's greatness. So what Amos is saying here as he confronts God's people is he's saying, by desiring the day of the Lord to come, it shows your arrogance and your ignorance. Israel was showing that they didn't know jack about God, his peace, or what it means to worship. That's really important, y'all. It says, y'all are really longing for the day of the Lord. Y'all really out here saying, Lord, come quick. Y'all don't even understand what that means. Did you, do you know that the day of the Lord for you is like <clears throat> darkness and not light? Like escaping a, a lion only to be confronted by a bear. By resting your hand to catch your breath. Right? Think about your, your favorite suspense movie and you see the main character running and gasping for air. He finally escapes the bear and then he escapes the lion. And then he finally hunches over, put, puts his hand on the wall, trying to catch his breath, only to have a snake bite his hand. Amos is saying, listen, y'all, y'all are asking for the Lord to come quick, but you don't even know what that means for you and the state that you're living in. For you to say, Lord, come quick, for you to say, may the day of the Lord come, for you to long for the day of the Lord shows your arrogance and your ignorance. It shows that you have no clue about who God is, what his peace is, and what it means to actually worship him. Now, church, you've got to understand that this ignorance and this arrogance by Israel was caused by the power they were coming into. That there is a power system and a power structure that Israel was assuming that caused them to be this arrogant and this ignorant. The leader of the time, Jeroboam, Jeroboam II, came into power and gave the elites of Israel at the time all that they ever wanted. He was their candidate. He was the candidate of the elites. He gave them exactly what they wanted. He expanded their land and he generated more wealth for them than any other king had most of Israel lived in a kind of triumphant reality, meaning that they, were, they, 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 they walked with this kind of ex, ex, exceptionalism that they thought themselves with. Most of Israel lived with a narrative of victory and, and a narrative of overcoming and celebration. In other words, they had very little to mourn and very little to lament. Now, Rich, why does this matter? What well, matters because power and the misuse and the abuse of power is not something that happens in a vacuum. Power is not an isolated incident. You step into systems of power. Power that came before you, power that will go after you. It's not happening because a few bad leaders. It's happening because there is a heritage of power that didn't begin with Jeroboam the second. You see, if we can't understand power and its abuse and its misuse as a historical heritage up to this point where Amos is speaking, then we won't understand why the power of Jesus is so satisfying and transformative. Power is not something that happens in a vacuum. You see, what Israel failed to realize is what we today in the American church also often failed to realize that victory, exceptionalism, triumphal, uh, triumphant, uh, triumphant realities, overcoming and celebration are, are not everyone's story. Not everyone lives with that narrative of victory. Not everyone lives with the narrative of overcoming and celebration. You see, Amos cries and sings this song because this is a form of singing what we're reading here in Amos 5. He sings this song of mourning to Israel and he says, you have wealth at the expense of the poor. You have freedom because, because in your power you enslaved your neighbor. Things are going well for you because you have advocates, people in your corner, while others don't even have proper representation in court. And if you thought that was something that I picked out of a newspaper in 2020, just go read Amos chapter 2. Amos chapter 2 confronts the leaders of Israel and the elites of Israel. He says, yo, Y'all don't even give proper representation in court to the poor. So listen, I know that you feel a lot of victory. I know that you feel a lot of triumph. I know that you feel a lot of uh, like peace. I know you, you, you are declaring peace. But let me tell you, that's not everyone's song. 
You have wealth at the expense of the poor. You have freedom because in your power, you enslave your neighbors. Things are going well for you because you got representation and advocates while others don't have representation in court. Listen, when our fundamental hope for meaning and value and purpose and acceptance is found in the accumulating of power, in the achievements that we have, in a leader or in a political ideal, we are sure to find injustice. We are sure to find the mistreatment of God's image in our neighbors. We are sure to conflate the name of God and in our sisters and in our brothers and in ourselves. Y'all know this name. He's not unfamiliar to the legacy family. Soon Cha Ra says this in his book, The Prophetic Lament. The American church avoids lament. The power of lament is minimized. And the underlying narrative of suffering that requires lament is loss. But absence does not make the heart grow fonder. Absence instead makes the heart forget. The absence of lament in the liturgy of the American church results in the loss of memory. We forget the necessity of lamenting over suffering and pain. We forget the reality of suffering and pain. And I would add, we forget people. Amos is like, oh, you you excited about God coming? But should you be? You excited about coming church, about God coming church, but should you be? It will be darkness and not light. It will be like a man who flees from a lion and is confronted by a bear. It is darkness rather than light, even gloom without brightness in it. Oh, you excited about God coming, but you shouldn't be. You stopped crying over the imbalance of society. You stopped crying over the theft others experience. You stopped crying over the death of your neighbors. You stopped crying over the violence others have experienced. You stopped crying. So church, you should not be eager for the Lord's coming. Because when you stop crying over the poor and vulnerable and outcast, instead of seeing them as your neighbors, hear me, they became your victims. You see, when we stop lamenting and when we stop crying over the vulnerable and the poor and the outcast, and let me be even more clear about who the vulnerable are in our country. Of course, they are the widows and orphans, even as the Bible tells us. But more particularly in the case of America, they are those with black skin. They are those that identify with the black community. When we stop lamenting and crying over the injustices done toward the poor and the vulnerable and the outcast and the marginalized and the forgotten, instead of seeing them as your neighbors, please hear me. They become your victims. Why do you think George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and the countless other names are no longer with us? Why are they not here with us today? Because America's version of Christianity has made it easy for whiteness to believe that it is more valuable than black lives. Now, let me be clear. I've said this to my church several times. And Brian, I'm grateful that you've given me the platform to preach here and to be honest about the way I'm seeing the world and the way that I'm seeing the text, the way that I experience God. I make a big distinction between whiteness and white people. When I say whiteness, I'm talking about the social structure. When I say whiteness, I'm talking about the system that gives privilege and inherent value or or, 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 or says that it has a greater inherent value to those of fair skin in and over black lives. You see, when we stop lamenting, we stop remembering. When we stop remembering, we stop caring. When we stop caring, we go from seeing people as our neighbors and fellow image bearers to making them, whether you know it or not, your victims. See, church, Amos is confronting God's people and say, y'all are excited when you shouldn't be. 
Y'all have not been living out the love of God that he's poured into you. I love the way Professor Barbara Brown Taylor puts it. If you don't know who she is, Google her. Read her books. She's an incredible mind and an incredible soul and has incredible insight. She says this. The problem is many of the people in need of saving are in churches. Many of the people are in churches. Many of the people in need of saving are in churches. And at least... Pardon me. There we go. Thank you, Legacy, for being with the kid. Barbara Brown Taylor says the problem is many of the people in church in need of saving are in churches. And at least part of what they need saving from is the idea that God sees the world the way that they do. Yo, I need to probably read that again. I know y'all not with me at my church. I tell people, well, before the pandemic, for sure. I tell people, yo, man, give me a who, give me a holler, give me an amen, give me a hallelujah, give me an ouch. Give me an ouch at least. Or give me a high five, give me an emoji. Listen to what Barbara Brown Taylor says. <clears throat> the problem is many of the people in need of saving are in churches. And at least part of what they need saving from is the idea that God sees the world the way that they do. Oh boy, we in trouble. You see, when we hope that anything other than God gives us ultimate meaning and joy, we become monsters fighting against God's good desires for the world. And rather than the day of the Lord being an exciting thing, it becomes a terrifying thing. But Amos doesn't only crush false hope, but he calls for true worship. This joker, Amos, he keeps his foot on the pedal, y'all. Look at verse 21. He says, I hate, I despise your feasts. I can't stand the stench of your solemn assemblies. Now, ironically, the only other time that I've seen God this passionate is when he's talking about his love. Right? Consider First John chapter 3 where he says, see what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children, and so we are. He explodes with emotion there through John. But here he says, I hate, I despise your feasts. In other words, your religious duties, your being at church gatherings, the raising of your hands to sing and play to me at your get-togethers, your attempts at repentance, your prayers, they all hella weak. They hella weak. Because you didn't think that my relationship with you to be enough to move you toward impacting the society around you. This is what uh, Brian mentioned just before we jumped into the sermon. He says, you're going to hear those Christians that will tell you, preach the gospel only. Man, just preach the gospel. We need the gospel. And I'm saying, this is it. This is what God is saying that the good news is. The good news is that you have access to a God through his son, that should transform and change all of you, the way that you see the world and the way that you engage with it, that the good news is good for your public life, that the good news is good news because you have access to a God that will change the way that you see the political world, that will change the way that you see your neighbor, that will change the way that you vote, that will change the way that you engage. If your good news is simply good only for your interpersonal relationship, then you've missed at least two other thirds of your faith. The systemic realities that you live in and the individual, it changes you, it changes your relationships and it changes the society that you as an agent of change lives in. Well, Amos is saying this ain't true worship. In fact, with these verses, Amos is saying, that to even suggest that at the heart of authentically following God is not a deep and fundamental concerns with the social ills of your society that we belong to, it stinks. I ain't saying this. This is what the text is saying. He's saying that to even suggest that at the very heart of following God is not a deep and fundamental concern with the social ills of the society that we belong to, it's a stench to God. 
It stinks in the presence of God. It is to think that you're offering God a beautiful song when when you're really just making noise. He says, I can't stand the sense of your solemn assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But instead, listen, here's the question that we should wrestle through. What, What are you doing? How are you engaging with God? Do you perhaps think that you're offering God a a beautiful song when when you're really just making noise? Do you think that your life is an aroma to God as you live it, as you exist with the gift of the gospel? Do you think that your life is an aroma to God or perhaps you're stinking it up in his presence? Instead, Amos offers a different vision. Verse 24, he says, but let justice flow like waters and righteousness like an unfailing stream. Now, Amos uses two really important words here that I think are really important if we're going to capture the picture that he's trying to paint here. The first one is justice, and the other one is righteousness. Now, righteousness is a word that's used to describe someone who's in good standing with God, which Israel at this moment clearly is not. And the result, and that result, I should say, in li- in, 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 that results in lives that are good and equitable, inequitable relationships in the world that they live in despite social difference. In other words, it, it doesn't matter if we're different in gender or in any other social category, we will treat each other with dignity and equity and kindness because God, though he was different for us, demonstrated the same. And justice is the other word that he uses, which refers to the concrete actions that we take to correct the unrighteousness of our own lives and the society that we live around it. To put it plainly, let me, let me put it plainly. Justice is mainly concerned with the outward while righteousness is concerned with the inward. Now, perhaps those two words are certainly more nuanced than that, but to put it plainly. God is essentially saying to them through Amos, the party is over. There's a bad smell at the party and it isn't the food. It's your rotten hearts. <laughs> there is noise at this party and it isn't pleasant. It's your music that is empty of authenticity and love for others. So it feels more like symbols crashing together. And I know that that paints another picture for you. It, it connects another dot for you. First Corinthians 13, right? where Paul exhorts the church to love. He says, your ethic is the one of love. To see love as the unifying characteristic of God and as a result, his church. Because without it, Paul says, we are nothing, is what 1 Corinthians says. Without it, our services, our feasts, our fellowships, our get-togethers are like symbols crashing together, making an unbearable noise to God. And church, what's crazy to me is that Israel, at the time of Amos, they would travel to these sacred places to worship. They had a temple that they they would all travel to, just the same way that we, before the pandemic, of course, went to the church building or gathered with the people at a physical location. And we we considered that small group, that community group, that that transformation group, that, that, that congregation, we considered that as sacred places because we knew that God was there with a purpose to transform us as we were together. What's crazy to me is that Israel was doing the same thing. They would, they would make these trips to these sacred places to worship God, but they were coming back home unchanged. Church, hear me. <laughs> Israel was making these trips to these sacred places, but they were coming back unchanged. Church, let me tell you what makes Christianity useless. Christianity is a useless religion when we leave God at the church. When we go to the sacred place, but we leave God there. This is what makes Christianity useless, that that we would come to church in worship, but go to our jobs in greed. This is what makes Christianity useless, that we would come to church with our hands stretched out to praise God, but go into our neighborhoods with our hands stretched out to take things from our neighbors. 
that we would come to church praying on our knees, but go into society praying on our neighbors, that we would come to church deeply aware of God's greatness, but go back out into society apathetic of the struggles of others. Israel was going to these holy places, but coming back unchanged, y'all. They were leaving God at church. And I'm afraid that many of us in the American church are doing the same and calling it Christianity. Some of us have relationships that we go to and we come back unchanged. The relationship doesn't challenge us, doesn't move us toward a deeper heart for God, doesn't increase our bandwidth to love others. And what Amos is saying here is that that is true worship. When we are with God in a profound and significant way that transforms us and it deepens our heart for God and widens our love for others. Amos is saying, this is true worship. Anything else is useless. Church, I'm not sure how you are living your life at this moment in the midst of your community, in your city, if my guess is that no matter where you're from, even as we heard, Boise, Idaho is up in flames and upside down. My guess is that if you're on this call and you live in any major city, or even if you live in a small city, your world is upside down right now. People are crying out for justice simply to be seen. People are crying out to simply be seen and acknowledged. For history to be acknowledged in this country. I said earlier that we should do, as Christians in this time, no less than prayer. But we can't reduce our existence during this time to prayer. In fact, I would challenge Christians here that would say, Lord, come quick with the sentiment of cowering from our responsibility to live in our society with the ethic of love. That perhaps we've lived in our Christian witness up to this point in a way that we shouldn't be excited for the day of the Lord. The picture that Jesus has always painted has been one of being with those that are often marginalized, outcast, poor, even by the church, even by the religious. I love the way Jesus interacted with the Samaritan woman, someone who was socially in almost every category on the outside. And the sheer presence of Jesus with her was a witness in itself, but But then he goes a bit further and he talks with her. He engages with her, breaking all the social norms of his time. And he offers her something. He says, everyone who drinks from this water, referring to the well that they were both at, they'll get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give to them will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water that I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Church, do we live with the ethic of love? The ethic of love that compels us to be with those that are on the outside, to see them, to acknowledge them, to enter into their pain before without any qualifiers simply to enter into their pain without any qualifiers and offer them as as they offer you their experience, that you would offer them your presence. I, um, I shared with my church a few weeks ago, uh, we, I pastor a, um, a church that is predominantly black and brown. Um, And by that, I mean those that um, are of the African-American community uh, and those that are from the Latino community uh, who identify themselves as Afro-Latino, black Latinos. Um, 
but are different shades of color. And um, I challenged my church <clears throat> the way that I think I'm gonna challenge some of you here. Um, if you're on this call and you're white, I've heard a lot of my white friends, pastor friends just hit me up, man, how can we be supportive? We're grateful for your leadership, grateful for the church. We're here as your ally and I believe them, I do. But I think it's really important for us to really understand that language, ally. That ally, as, as my buddy Ray said, he's one of our members here at the church. He said, ally has two L's and you're gonna have to hold a lot of those. <laughs> I don't know what the response is to that, but man, that's a, that's a bar. Ally has two L's. And you're going to have to hold some else. Because an ally in the, in the context of actual war was someone who wasn't just in the back supporting, but someone who was uh, in the crossfires, risking the potential of being killed and shot themselves just as those who were in the war. So when we use the word ally, Let's be sure that we know that with that, you are going to take some L's and that you are putting yourself in the crossfires of those who are in the war themselves. If you are a white passing Latino, someone that if you were to, they would look at you, uh, they wouldn't be able to tell that you are Latino because we got a lot of those in the Latino community. I need you to acknowledge the, the ways that you've benefited from your lighter complexion. That part of this process, as we exist during this social moment, it will be your responsibility to acknowledge the ways that you've benefited from a lighter complexion. Identify the racism, prejudice, and discrimination in yourself and in those that were around you toward darker skin. Now, I will say that the Latino identity is a very complex one. But to those that are of fair skin and lighter complexion, acknowledge the ways as part of your healing and as part of your allyship and as part, as, as part of your existence as a Christian in this time, acknowledge the ways that your lighter complexion has benefited you. If you are a darker skinned Latino, an Afro Latino, un undeniably a Afro Latino, acknowledge that, that what's happening to the George Floyds, the Amar, Ahmaud Arbery, the Breonna Taylors, isn't simply happening to the African-American community, but it's also happening to you. Embrace your own blackness as part of the African diaspora. I talk a lot about this at my church because I think ethnic identity is really important to the spiritual journey. So when I talk to my Afro-Latinos, I need you to understand that you are black. Don't disassociate yourself from what's happening to our African-American brothers. It's happening to you. And if you get caught on the street and are confronted, you are black. You are a black brother and a black sister that speaks Spanish. Like you see, I'll tell you the same thing that I told my church. <clears throat> we can't even pandemic in peace. And it's our responsibility, it's our responsibility to create a safe space that people can experience the peace of God. Be like Jesus. <laughs> Trust in the spirit that the ascension gave to us. Just a few days ago was Pentecost Sunday. Ironically enough, the day where fire came down on the disciples that we would ignite certain fires into the world, that we would live with deep compassion and love and justice because the fire of God dwells in us. Legacy, I pray that you would be able to see Jesus today more clearly than you have in the past, that he would give you the boldness and courage and his very spirit to live in this social moment that we exist in that you would not 
cowardly cry out, Lord, come, because your version of the world and the way you believe it should function is being disrupted. These first three months have been a very long year. But maybe this is the moment that God is using to do in his church what we've been stubborn to do. Love you guys. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you. I'm grateful for this time. Grateful for Legacy, Brian and Cannon uh, and everyone else who tuned in. God, Holy Spirit, I have uh, no control over how you take this word and deposit it into your people. I do with this sermon as you did on that mountain in front of your disciples, God. I let it ascend. <laughs> I let this sermon ascend uh, to where it needs to go just as you ascended uh, and sent your spirit. So God, may you do that work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.